Okay, so um, tonight we're going to tell the story of Arthur Ashe, UCLA, and the connections to the U.S. Open that you've all agreed to participate in. Next slide. We'll talk about the significance of Arthur Ashe. We're going to focus a little bit on um, this time at UCLA. You're going to find when you're at the booth that people are going to come and they'll, you're, you're, going to, you're going to get Bruins, you're going to get people who are going to want to talk to you about UCLA. And um, we'll, we'll focus a little bit on what he did there. Talk about what's different for this year since so many of you are first timers. You won't know that it's different because you won't have had the experience in prior years. Um, talk about the connections between the U.S. Open and Arthur Ashe. Um, how UCLA currently incorporates Arthur Ashe and what he accomplished and represented in our curriculum today, in the campus today, um, making it very contemporary, what the future of that's going to look like, and then questions, but we're also at the end, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike to talk a little bit about the logistics that you may need to know in terms of the um, uh, work that you'll be doing at the booth. Next slide. So Arthur Rush was born in Richmond, Virginia, 1943, very much the segregated South. Um, one of the things that's significant about his life is he's at that transition from the Jim Crow South to the Civil Rights Movement, but his experience was very much what we would call a, a, a Jim Crow one, segregated housing, segregated schools, segregated churches. His father was the groundskeeper for what was the Negro playground, and that came with a house, which then he grew up next door to the tennis court on the playground. And that's how he got connected to tennis. He literally lived with a tennis court in his yard and was recognized at a very young age as really quite the phenom. Going through, though, an all Negro um, um, uh, process of training and so forth. Clearly, clearly standout player. And the uh, uh, Tennis powers that be that wanted a great future for him said to his father, his mother died when he was very young, said to his father, you know, you, you need to move him for his senior year to some place where A, he can play more white players because that wasn't really an option in Richmond and you only get better by playing people better than you, right? That's how you improve. Also, with more opportunities for year-round tennis. So his father agreed that he would spend his senior year in St. Louis at Charles Sumner High School, which is one of the most famous high schools of African Americans. Other alums of Sumner are uh, Tina Turner. Uh, she was Annie Mae Bullock when she was there. Dick Gregory, some of you were old enough to remember uh, Dick Gregory, Robert E. Young. So real stellar cast of people that came out of, 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 of uh, Sumner. This is his high school tennis team that senior year. One of the people we've been able to interview for the oral history project is the gentleman next to him in his classes, who I just happened to run into at a UCLA retirement party. Uh, and oh, we have his story of Arthur's senior year. One of the points that you know we think is important to make, and I make this, I teach a class on Arthur Ashe at UCLA, is what an academic he was, and this may come up at the booth. He was valedictorian of his senior class, uh, and so a, a really outstanding student academically, as well as uh, the number one, it depends on what book you look at, the number one or the number two tennis college recruit the year he graduated from high school, he and Charlie Passerell are, are, are one and two or two and one, depending on how you look at it. Next slide. Next, okay, okay. So he comes to UCLA. He was aggressively recruited by J.D. Morgan. Um, he and Charlie Passerell uh, to, to come to UCLA. He, uh, uh, Morgan took him out, him and Charlie out to the best steak restaurant he knew of in Beverly Hills. 
and uh, and sat them down and said, "So we're Bruins now, right?" <laughs> and Charlie felt like they hadn't made up their mind beyond that they would go to the same school because they were best friends. Uh, but they had agreed they were going to go to the same school, and it was going to be USC or UCLA. But Arthur had always been enamored, understandably so, of Jackie Robinson. So he wanted to go to the school Jackie Robinson went to. So he just looked at Morgan and said, yeah, we're going to UCLA. When I'm teaching my course, I do a slide with a contrast between the one before with this high school tennis team and his team at UCLA. He went from an all black team, an all black uh, um, high school, a very integrated background to Westwood. Um, very, very different place, very different set of circumstances. We've also been able to interview for the Oral History Project individuals from um, the tennis teams that he was on as, as well there. Next slide. So, yeah, um, uh, those of you who lived on campus, uh, Ash was in Sproul Hall. Yeah. <laughs> he majored in business administration. He was in ROTC, as most males were. Um, John Lamble was in ROTC with him uh, at UCLA uh, in the, um, can we mention the decade? Yes, of course, the 60s. <laughs> in the 60s. Um, so uh, that's, that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons John keeps coming, coming back to us. He may take a, 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 a commitment to, talk to, to ROTC. And Chenary in the box there, who's operating the slides, has interviewed. What are what are you up to now? Seven people who are in ROTC with them? Yeah, it's about seven. Um, maybe a, a little bit more because I just added someone last week. But uh, yeah, it's been a, a really a treasure to be able to add to this archive in a way that we didn't expect to to be able to find. So I would encourage people again when when people come to the booth and say, "Oh, I knew the camp there because that that happens." Take down their contact information for us. We follow up. Some of the people that we've interviewed for the project have come from um, chance encounters uh, at the at the at the booth. Um, next slide. Very distinguished tennis record at UCLA, an All-American for three years, won the singles title in 1965, and was the uh, captain of a winning team in 1965. Next slide. Um, this is, um, we're, um, we're, we're going to share some of the clips from the Oral History Project um, to give you an, a, a, a sense of the reach of, of Arthur Ashe. Um, this is someone whose interview, I think, exemplifies Ash's ongoing commitment to UCLA. Um, so, Chenary, let's hope the audio gods are with us. And play yes, okay. I'm going to play it right now and just let me know if you can hear it. It has been unbelievable. And to get a degree from one of the finest public schools in the, in the world, UCLA, and that's, you know, that was Arthur, you know. I, I, the last time I spoke with you, we were trying to figure out when I met him, and I was able to track it down from an article. You know, if you want me to read that, it's not necessary. It uh, says, uh, Marcel Freeman played extremely well through the whole tournament. He's been gung-ho since the start. He told me early, I'm going to get this one. Freeman felt well prepared for this tournament. I have more confidence than I've ever had. This was when I was 18. I've been practicing more than I ever have. I knew some, everybody in the tournament was rooting for me. Uh, it says, uh, oh, this was, again, let me see. I, I knew I could win if I played up to par, but that's not always easy to do match after match. This is Marcel's last year of junior competition. The 18-year-old star of the Schreiber High School team said he hopes, he said he's applied to UCLA and hopes to go there in the fall. It appears Butch Seawagon, Butch Seawagon was a great world-class player. The coach of Columbia, because I was being recruited by Columbia, okay? It appears Butch Seawagon, the coach of Columbia tennis team, made a tactical error in his recruiting of Freeman. Seawagon and Arthur were really good friends. Seawagon arranged for Freeman to hit against Arthur Ashe 
And Ash, of course, is a UCLA graduate. I can't believe I'll be packing my bags and taking my stereo out to California, uh, said Marcel. And so that's where it started. Wow. And that's so when I met Arthur was when I was being recruited. And, and, uh, and then I, I end up doing this exhibition with Arthur, right, in Port Chester, Connecticut for, for uh, uh, one of Arthur's many foundations and he, he's he's just the most incredible man right but so this was with a great tennis player colin dibley who had the fastest serve in the in the pro game arthur me and another local guy who was great john hayes but this was in 1977 as well so i met arthur through the columbia head coach they were good friends which sea wagon and columbia was recruiting me and he goes, you want to play with Arthur Ash? I went, oh my God. But Arthur had different ideas and said, well, you, you know, I went to UCLA and that, that changed my life and it changed my world. And I would consider going to UCLA. And not only that, and there was one other piece that I had for you, uh, that I hope to have for you. And I looked all over, it was a letter that Arthur wrote to me after, um, I did this United Negro College Fund get together with Arthur Ashe at uh, Madison Square Garden, uh, but I don't have that. But Butch Seawagon, so, so when I went to UCLA, I had zero money. My coach, Rick Elsing, gave me $500. My mom gave me, I think, $50. She was a taxi driver, and she gave me a box of leaves and $50, fall leaves right, to represent the season's change. Uh, and Arthur gave me $500. Arthur, Rick Elstein, my mom, and my dad uh, packed up all my gear, stamped Marcel Freeman on every one of my albums, and, uh, and I went to UCLA. So that's many years, of course, after Arthur had graduated and still when he's encountering good, strong, young talent, he is recruiting them to UCLA. Um, in terms of, of Arthur at the US Open, obviously the, 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 what, one of the highlights is in 1968 when Arthur won the US Open. Um, people will say that he was the first African American to win the US Open, which is true, but he's also the first American to win the US Open because that was the first year of, of, the, of the Open. So uh, he has that distinction. Um, he was still in ROTC and had been, was, they call it paid back. You have to do X amount of time after um, your college education is, is, is paid for. And, Arthur was assigned to West Point um, for much of that time, and, and we've, inter we've interviewed a lot of some of the people he was um, with in, in, in West Point. His brother was a Marine in Vietnam. Uh, he beat Tom Oker, who was called the Flying Dutchman in those days. Uh, and because he was still ranked an amateur, he couldn't technically accept the purse. So Ogre got the purse for the tournament. And uh, there were people who felt that that was unfair to Arthur. So there was a little bit of behind the scenes dealings that ended up with Arthur getting the equivalent amount through some kind of a, a, a peculiar channel of which I'm told that back in those days of tennis were more um, common than uncommon. Uh, Billie Jean King has a lot to say about how compensation uh, rolled out back, back, and back in those days. But, um, but, a, but, but a real highlight. You might have people come up to you in the booth and said, "Oh, I was here when he won in 1968." Uh, next slide. Um, lots of books have been written about Arthur. And uh, he has written many books himself. Uh, uh, we may have time to talk about something. This one, um, The Levels of the Game by John McPhee, the fabulous New Yorker uh, writer, was Arthur's own favorite book uh, uh, about himself. And it just takes apart what it's, 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 it's a fabulous examination of, um, of uh, 
him and one opponent and, uh, and takes it through. Next slide. Uh, you know, we're just on the heels. John just uh, wore his eyes out watching Wimbledon uh, for, for, for 2022. Uh, Arthur, uh, again, don't let people say it was the first African American to win Wimbledon. Let them say it was the first African American man to win Wimbledon. Althea Gibson won uh, two decades earlier uh, the women's. One of the people you might meet at, at the booth, he comes through journalist Richard Evans, who you'll be hearing a little bit later on. But a uh, trivia point Richard was Althea Gibson's date at the Wimbledon Ball uh, <laughs> in the 1950s. <laughs> Uh, uh, Arthur won in 1975. It was highly unexpected, and I, I, I think we may have a clip about that, but uh, I believe he entered rank 16. He was uh, going up against Jimmy Connors, who was just considered in those days unbeatable, and particularly unbeatable by Arthur. People will say that that Arthur Ashe was the first African American man to win Wimbledon. He was also the last African American man to win Wimbledon. No male has won since that victory in 1975. Next slide. So yeah, here's Richard. So here, Richard uh, will talk a little bit about the uh, match because. He was, I mean, Jimmy Connors was the hottest favorite in the world to win that match. He had a style of play that, that he just fed off Arthur's power. And that's what Jimmy Connors could do. He was a little guy. Jimmy Connors was a little man. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have the strength to generate power despite his weird steel racket, which did give him power to an extent. He needed power coming at him because he had such a good eye uh, he saw the ball so early that he could use his opponent's power. And Arthur, the night before, he'd always lost to Jimmy, practically always. And he knew this was going to be his one and only chance of winning Wimbledon. And Donald Dell and Charlie, Passerelle and Arthur went off to the Playboy Club in Park Lane the night before and worked out a plan. It was the place to go in those days. It, it was, you know, everybody thinks, well, Playboy Club. It was, everybody went to the Playboy Club. You got served by bunnies, you know. But, um, and they, there was gambling, and Arthur liked to play roulette and all that. He was, he was quite a, a little gambler, Arthur. Um, and they worked out a plan. And the plan was to give Jimmy Connors no pace. But that was a problem. Because Arthur's whole game was built on wham, bam, thank you, man. How, how hard can I hit the ball with that sweeping forehand and lovely backhand? And he blitzed players, you know, with his power. But he knew if he tried that against Jimmy Connors, he was going to lose. So he completely changed his style of play, which is the most incredibly difficult thing to do for a, 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 an athlete at that level of sport. And he dinked and drop shot and pushed and lobbed. And Connors was totally bewildered. He didn't know what to do because he couldn't generate any power off these little dinky, pushy, soft balls that Arthur was throwing at him. And so he, he collapsed for two sets. Someone um, yelled something out of the crowd to come on Jimmy and he yelled back I'm trying I'm trying you know he was livid Jimmy was not a good loser mm -hmm. and somehow he got back into the match and he won the third set and I thought uh, uh here we go because so many people this was the critical moment so many people in that situation would have panicked and thought oh my ruse worked for a bit but he's cottoned on to it and the instinct would have been to revert to norm. The instinct would have been just to slip the switch and go back to how Arthur played tennis all his life, but he didn't. He he kept looking at his little notes of the thing and, and you know, totally serene, totally calm. And he said to himself, now I'm going to stick with this. And Jimmy Connors fell apart again in the fourth set. Wow. wow. And 
it was the most intellectually, tactically brilliant victory I've ever seen, virtually in any sport. Oh, because wow. uh, for a person of Arthur's stature to change that dramatically against a, a player of Connor's stature in the most important moment of his entire life. I mean, you know, having being able to say Arthur Ashe Wimbledon champion or Arthur Ashe, but two different things. Arthur would have been great anyway. He'd have been loved. He, he'd have achieved great things in life. But winning the Wimbledon title was huge for him. Mm. And for black players everywhere, for African Americans, for, for every black sportswoman or sportsman in the world, having a black male Wimbledon champion to join Althea Gibson as a black female Wimbledon champion was just a, a wonderful boost for okay. black sport. So um, in uh, my trivia about Wimbledon balls, the uh, 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 women's winner of the year of 1975 was Billie Jean King. And traditionally, the first dance of the Wimbledon ball is danced by the male and female winner. So Billie Jean King and Arthur Ashe danced the first dance that year. And Billie Jean leaned into him and said, this is the first time in the history of Wimbledon that two people with an afro are dancing the first dance. <laughs> because if you remember what Billie Jean's hair looked like in 1975, she had as much of an afro as he did. Uh, as he um, uh, moved um, beyond his career as a tennis player and as an athlete, and, and, and simultaneously in the case of South Africa, he became very engaged in the, the politics of apartheid. He wanted to visit South Africa and his request was turned down three consecutive years because he they did not want a Negro, a, a, a Negro player to, to play. And they didn't want a Negro player with Arthur's values to play. So if you look at their record of all of this, they say things like, oh, he could have come, he just would have had to have agreed to play in segregated stadiums and in all white situations. And he said he wanted to come, but he wanted the stadiums to be integrated. He wanted the opportunity to tour townships. Um, and he wanted to see for himself what apartheid was like. So finally, the political pressure was such on the South African government that they granted him an initial, an initial um, a visa. And he, he, he went back not just to South Africa, but other African nations several several times. Uh, we have some great material on uh, on him uh, in the oral history project from his whole South African experience, including a really uh, powerful interview with Don Matera, a poet who smuggled a poem. It's hard to even think about now having to smuggle a poem, but smuggled a poem that he'd written in honor of him. Uh, as he was leaving, and, and uh, this is on my mind because Patera just uh, died last week and, and, and we heard from his foundation. Nelson Mandela was a huge sports fan, and within being a sports fan, he was a huge tennis fan. Tennis was a very big sport to, in, in South Africa. I, I have to explain to my students sometimes how important it was for if you were gonna be a competitive international tennis player, you really sort of had to be able to play in South Africa in the 1960s, where a whole chunk of where the action was was taken off your, your table. So, uh, so Arthur really wanted to have the same opportunities as, as other internationally ranked tennis players. Mandela was following the controversies about Ash from Robben Island, from his, his, his cell. And when, um, when um, Mandela was released from jail, became president of South Africa, and Ash was here in the United States suffering, you can see how thin he is in that picture, 
he had full blown AIDS at this point. And they asked Mandela, you know, you're coming to the United States for the first time, who do you want to meet? He said Arthur Ashe. So that that um, connection, which was by then many decades old, was was very important, uh, very important to him. And he's still very much, Ash is still very much a hero in South Africa. Next slide. Um, at, in terms of his tennis career, he went from being a player to being a coach uh, and uh, being a journalist. So he always, a tennis journalist, he always remained connected to the sport that way. His time as Davis Cup coach was uh, uh, charged uh, because the players, that was the sort of uh, era of the real sort of bratty tennis players. Uh, John McEnroe, uh, and he um, had many a um, dust up, uh, uh, Connors and so forth. And he was very old school and very focused on decorum and politeness and maturity. Uh, and, and that was an interesting, an interesting segment, segment of his career. But he loved the Davis Cup. He loved that opportunity to play on a team. Tennis is such an individual sport. And he was very attracted to the, the opportunity to be one of, a, a member of a team. Next slide. Um, one of the most interesting things in these stats to me is look at that prize money figure. <laughs> you know, think about what people make in tennis now. His career prize money was a million and a half dollars across his whole career. Uh, very, very different, very different era. Uh, next slide. His health issues uh, began with he, he both maternally and paternally there was cardiac disease in his family. He had heart attacks in 1979 and 1983. He was really one of the first people to connect with the uh, American Heart Association to publicize the importance of knowing your family's cardiac history. This is when this was actually something that was just coming to the front. We all take this for granted now. But um, in the late 70s and early 80s, it wasn't as commonly known that if you had family history of cardiac uh, problems, you were more susceptible yourself. And he did lots of efforts to, as a spokesman for the warning signs. Uh, after uh, his heart attack in 1983, he had a blood transfusion. And those were the days before blood was being tested um, uh, no, uh, uh, for, for, for HIV AIDS. And that was the source of the AIDS virus. Next slide. I mentioned earlier that was in addition to being a complete bibliophile himself, had an, enorm had an enormous library, uh, he was a, a dedicated writer himself. Amongst the things that I find most compelling are Hard Road to Glory, which is a three volume, very thick set of resource books that is the history of African American sports from 1619 up until the um, 1980s when he wrote the book. This is just the cover of the first volume that's there. And then when his um, HIV AIDS diagnosis had been concretized, he worked with um, Arnold Rampersad, a professor at Princeton, on his autobiography, Days of Grace, which is obviously much more, much more personal account. Uh, it, it's his final. He wrote other autobiographical books earlier in his life, but his passion for literature was very, very deep. Excellent. He was um, a, a family man. Uh, he was uh, devoted to his brother. If you, uh, some of you may have seen the ESPN um, 20 for 20, uh, there's a, there's a, one of those documentaries about his relationship with his brother, Johnny. I mentioned earlier that Johnny Ash was in Vietnam 
when Arthur was at UCLA and building his, his career as a tennis player, Johnny was what they called back then in country, so really on the grounds as a Marine in Vietnam. And Arthur was launching his tennis career and in ROTC at a point at which the war turned and they were bringing many, many more of um, ROTC graduates into Vietnam. And Johnny was really worried that if they brought Arthur into Vietnam, they would derail his tennis career. So he went to his um, superior officer and said, if I re-enlist for another round, will they let my brother stay stateside? Because they didn't like to have two brothers uh, in, in, the, in, in conflict. And his uh, uh, officer said, well, you're a very good Marine. I'd like to take that forward because they wanted to keep Johnny. So Johnny re-upped for another round in Vietnam, again, really with the fighting so that his brother could play tennis. And if you ever see the Johnny's interview from time to time in documentaries about this, and he talks about watching the US Open in a, on military television, and it's really, it's really quite, quite moving. Um, Arthur married once, I'll go back, um, Mary. Arthur married once, he married well. Uh, Jeannie Matusini Ash, uh, they were married at the UN over here, the UN chapel. Um, he often said it was a harbinger that he was on crutches that, that they, did, they got married because health problems were, were such a part of their, of their married life. That's their daughter, Camera with Jeannie at the US Open the year that they introduced, introduced the uh, Arthur Ashe uh, uh, postage, postage stamp. Those of you working the U.S. Open around Arthur Ashe Kids Day may have a chance. It's the most likely time you'll, you'll have to meet uh, Jeannie and Cameron and or Camera. Um, next slide. And then this one I think is another one that exemplifies that outreach that and the impact that he had on other players. Um, go ahead and play it, Sherry. Okay, right. And you mentioned having your two older brothers, I built your two siblings, um, and it, it was them who first got into tennis. Am, am, am I correct in that? And then you kind of followed along? Yeah, I mean, begrudgingly so. I mean, it wasn't something that they were interested in doing. You know, every summer, we were members of the Martin Luther King um, Junior Boys Club, which is right there on the west side on Sacramento and Washington Boulevard. And every summer, they had a summer sporting activity. That summer happened to be tennis. Um, so they were enrolled in the program. My parents were teaching summer school that summer. And so I had to be a tag along sister. And I was only six at the time and they were seven and nine years older than me, um, almost seven and nine years. So in the program for nine to 18 year olds. And so I was too young. They were, they fit the age group. And I literally had to sit outside of the, the courts for two weeks until I finally badgered my way in with the coaches and my parents and the club supervisors to let me participate because I'm just sitting there. And I was a much better athlete than all of the kids on the court at the age of six, of course. Um, but it was, you know, it was fun when I got a chance to go out there and, and I'm a visual learner. So I had seen all the things that I needed to do and what not to do. And so when I finally got a racket in my hand, I hit it perfectly over the net into the court. And the instructor said, have you played before? I'm like, no. I said, but I've been watching for two weeks and I know what I'm not supposed to do. So they got a kick out of that. And I had a little attitude and, you know, a little cocky attitude, but, uh, but it was fun. And it was, it was a great experience for me. It was a, a great summer. I think the program was originally eight weeks. I ended up only going for six weeks. But it was also a summer where Arthur Ashe won Wimbledon in 1975, where he beat Jimmy Connors in the finals. And I remember watching it at home on our little 12 inch black and white TV, you know, looking at this tall, lean black man going, wait a minute, you can do this on TV? Mm. And so that was kind of a, you know, an, an inspirational um, experience at that moment, not knowing what, who Arthur was or or what he had accomplished or what even Wimbledon meant. 
um, at that age. But of course, as you get older and you start to understand the sport and you learn a little a little bit more about the history, uh, you know, I vividly remember that summer because that was the summer that I started playing tennis. Mm. So, um, Arthur, uh, Arthur uh, health deteriorated through the late 1980s into the early 1990s. Obviously, his diagnosis came for what we take for granted now would be AIDS cocktail and so forth. He continued to be an activist. He continued to write. He worked on Days of Grace. Um, 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 through the very end of his life, he continued to work as an activist. He had hoped to keep his HIV AIDS diagnosis private for as long as possible. But um, as more and more people knew, word got to the editors at USA Today, and they um, uh, wanted to run a story. Um, he would have, he was the one of the first very prominent heterosexuals with name recognition to have the diagnosis. And you factor into that being an athlete, being African-American, there was extraordinary newsworthiness about this. But he had camera, he had a little girl. Those days, the stigma around AIDS, it was still where you thought you could get it if you were in a room for some of the days and sneezed five minutes earlier or something like that. You touch something that somebody touched. So the stigma was profound and he wanted privacy for himself and for, particularly for, for Cameron, his daughter. But uh, a friend actually, who we've interviewed for the project, a friend of his was working for the USA Today and went to him and said, my editor is gonna print this story um, and we'd like to do it with a quote from you. And he said, um, thank you for letting me know that. And he called a press conference and announced himself ahead of, of, of that publication so that he could, I think the language we use now, control the narrative. Uh, and uh, and uh, some of us can remember that press conference uh, uh, quite vividly. Next slide. Uh, very highly, very highly covered. Uh, um, we included the, 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 the Daily Bruin story on it there. But he continued to speak out. He be, immediately became an activist and started the Arthur, uh, Arthur Esch Foundation for the, the Elimination of AIDS. Chenari or Yolanda, if you can help me with the title, put it in the chat maybe. But a, a, a working foundation for um, uh, AIDS research. Next slide. So one of the um, one of the causes that was very important to him, yeah, there we go, Arthur Institute, Ash Institute of um, Arthur Ash Foundation for the Defeat of AIDS. Um, one of the causes that was very important to him was what what many perceived as the unfair and differential treatment between Haitian refugees and other refugees to the United States. Um, to the point where within a few months of his death, he agreed to go to Washington and protest in front of the White House. Um, that's before they had barricades, because obviously it's before September 11th. Um, this is a point at which he's immunocompromised. So for him to be out with other people like this, and he was hospitalized after, uh, hospitalized after being jailed after this march, but that's how important the cause was to him and what he knew, the name recognition of having him there with other members of Trans Africa. That's the group that was um, very much engaged with, with this uh, at the time. So um, I think the next clip is, the, the next slide is a clip about this moment. Yeah. But it made a statement. And the fact that he was going to be there increased the likelihood that others were going to show up and be a part of the event. And it was for that, there was a Haitian refugee crisis at the time. And I 
was only vaguely aware of it. And he fooled me on it. He told me what it was all about. Very quickly. And, uh, I, I, I had a conflict. I mean, I, I thought real hard about going with him, but you know, he didn't invite me and I had something else. And so I did drop him off, but it, you know, it, he, at that point in his life, he was frail and his time was short. I, I'm guessing this is, I can't remember if this is before or after, we could figure this out if it was before or after he had announced it publicly, but he was frail and he knew his time was short, but he was gonna be at the front of that line. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I'll tell you something else, of all the time that I worked with him, he was never a no-show. And he was almost never late, except for the time that I went, I waited for the green light, right. And that was just how he operated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, he never was a no-show. Okay, so he died on February 6, 1993. Um, he's still very much a presence in, in tennis, um, uh, in, in, in AIDS research, um, and, and we're entrusted with his legacy at UCLA. Next slide. So Jeannie Ash, Mrs. Ash started the mission of uh, the Arthur Ashe Learning Center. She converted the Arthur Ashe Foundation for the Defeat of AIDS in about 2007 or 8 when AIDS, I don't know if you use the language that AIDS has been defeated, but it is not the fatal diagnosis that it once was. And so she thought that the, uh, one of the other things that Arthur was really passionate about was young people and learning. I didn't even put in any slides. You know, Arthur is one of the co-founders of the National Junior Tennis League which is another whole component of his legacy. Um, but she wanted to focus on young people and on education. And she started the Arthur Ashe Learning Center, uh, as I say, uh, uh, circa, circa 2007. Next slide. Um, part of what they did was establish the booth that you'll be um, 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 manning and womaning uh, at the U.S. Open. The purpose of the booth is to um, talk about the legacy and impact of Arthur Ashe. The merchandise that you sell there underwrites an undergraduate scholarship at UCLA and other efforts like our oral history collection. The, 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 the resources that we get from the sale of the merchandise feed back into this program. Um, most of you who are participating are UCLA alums, but some of the people who were volunteers back when it was the Arthur Ashe Learning Center remain involved. So you may, you may be staffing the booth with people who are um, really, really old timers uh, with the project. Next slide. Um, it, it's very appropriate, just a little bit of background, of course, the major stadium at the U.S. Open is the Arthur Ashe Stadium, which was named and dedicated in 1997. Whitney Houston sang there, and it's the largest tennis-only venue in the world. Next. Uh, other ways in which Arthur is present there, when you walk in that main entrance to the grounds, there's a huge statue of Arthur right there in front of the stadium. In the small world, isn't it? category. I had drinks with Eric Fischel a week ago tonight. The sculptor who uh, did that statue is, is from my hometown uh, on the eastern end of Long Island, and we were at the same scholarship party last week. So I've been bugging him about getting his drawings and his papers for the statue and everything to UCLA, and he's very um, amenable to that. Next slide. Um, there are other statues. There's a statue of Arthur uh, in Richmond, but this is this is Jeannie's favorite. Is the one that uh, that Eric that Eric did. 
Next slide. So she and members of the board of directors came to UCLA in 2015, back when, when I was the dean, and said that she was she's an artist, she's a photographer, she wanted to spend more of her time on her artwork, but wanted the work of the Arthur Ashe Learning Center to continue, wanted the booth to continue. Two members of her board were UCLA alums who said, well, he graduated from UCLA, maybe they would be interested in taking this on. So um, um, I met with them then. Uh, with members of my team, we, we um, did a bit of an informal feasibility study. You realize this means a public university in California is running a program that's based in New York. I mean, we run into things with the booth a couple of years about how to pay New York State income taxes from UCLA. There are all kinds of like bureaucratic things that are uh, make, make this a, li a little bit on the complicated side, but we're so proud of our association with, you, with uh, Arthur Ashe that, that, that we continue to make it work. Um, our first year, we did a pilot year, it was 2016. Um, and I believe all of the three people who are veterans were here, we go back to 2016, Mike, Chris, and John, yeah. Um, um, Mrs. Ash was sufficiently pleased with us that she formally dissolved the Arthur Ashe Learning Center, her 501c3, and transferred all of its assets to UCLA. And with that, we established the Arthur Ashe Legacy Fund. Arthur, as I said earlier, is still very prominent on campus today. He was a charter member of the Athletic Hall of Fame in 1984. Our Health and Wellness Center was dedicated to him in um, 1998. Um, the gift that we got from the Arthur Ashe Learning Center includes a couple of photography collections. One of them is currently on display in Haynes Hall. I teach a freshman seminar on Arthur Ashe and the second half of the 20th century. And we're in the process now of moving um, the Ashe program to the Ralph Bunch Center at UCLA, which is dedicated to the study of African American history and culture, Ralph Bunch also a prominent African-American UCLA alum, uh, former um, uh, 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 winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and avid tennis fan himself, actually. Uh, next slide. Um, so we, uh, we have the Arthur Ashe Scholarship Fund, if people ask you what goes, you know, the money for these t-shirts, you're, you're they're, they're buying. Um, we were, were, were moving towards sponsoring the full cost of attendance for a student that exemplifies Ash's values. Um, we, one of the things that we got with the gift was a art exhibit that we want, that's currently in storage that we want to repurpose. We're in the process of repurposing it to um, install it again. Um, and want to continue to um, incorporate where we've become more and more of a resource for research on um, many topics related to Arthur Ashe's life, um, um, biographies, um, documentaries. Um, there are talks now about a docu-pick along the line of um, 42, if you're familiar with the one on, on Jackie Robinson. Okay, um, Mike, I think we're going to move into uh, uh, your part now. Um, and the, the things that I will um, specifically draw your attention to are the, um, there is a company, Rowing Blazers, that Jeannie Ash has a partnership with. They are going to begin to be marketing um, merchandise, sweaters, sweatpants, jackets, um, a variety of merchandise with the ash imprimatur and image on it. Um, a portion of their profits are going to go to the Arthur Ashe Legacy Fund. So they're going to be prominent at the booth this year. They've been a part of our, our putting it together. 
They're going to give you some clothing. You're going to get some swag that if you choose to wear it, uh, you may. We also run a spark campaign because you'll find in the booths that sometimes people will say things to you like, um, well, I don't really want to buy a t-shirt, but this sounds like a good cause. How do I get money? And the SPAR campaign is the way that they can um, support the program if they don't want to um, have another visor in their in their closets. Um, and so, um, and we're, we've got new merchandise. You'll all get the official T-shirt every year. There is one T-shirt that has the USTA logo on it, which means it has to be approved by the the outfit that licenses Ash's name. It has to be approved by the USTA. It has. I, they send it to you approve, and I'm like. I, I, I'm just anything everybody else approves, I approve. <laughs> I'm not going to be the one who holds this up. But Mike, do you want to talk a little bit more about what the volunteers uh, um, might expect to uh, be hearing from you or, or like the group? Well, my hope is that you know everyone who volunteers has a good time. I mean, it's, a, it's an exciting kind of an, an environment, especially as you get closer to uh, the final championship days. Uh, you know, so I, I would just ask that, you know, for the volunteers, uh, you know, be on time. If you have, uh, if you're unable to make it or, you know, because things come up, uh, let me know. You can do so by email and I'll certainly uh, also give you my uh, phone number. Uh, and and uh, we're trying to put together uh, three, four people per ship. Uh, so it's not an overwhelming a lot, you know, work to do. Uh, but you know, we, we, we want you to, you know, engage the customers and the people who want to know more about Arthur Ashe. And of course, try to move the merchandise because that's how we fund the scholarship. Uh, but, but, you know, overall, have a good time. All right. Great. Do you have any questions specific to Mike? Now, how do we get in? Well, we are going to, uh, I guess the next phase is credential. Uh, so we've got every, everyone who has, you know, volunteered. We've got the shifts laid out. Uh, most importantly, we have your email addresses. And with those email addresses, we turn it over to the person in charge at the uh, USTA, and, and then they'll start the credentialing process. So they'll be sending out emails to get that process started. So it's with those credentials that you get kind of an expedited entrance, you know, into the facility. Yeah. And you can use your credentials on days that you're not volunteering. Right. If you want to go see the matches that are not in Ash Stadium, right? The, right. the qualifying matches, right. I guess. You can try to get in there. <laughs> there's no harm in trying. You know. during, during the week, from past experience, during the week, you can get in um, to, to Ash and to the Nordstrom and the Grandstand. Usually, there's no problem. If there's a big play, you know, the process playing or whatever, it, it might be difficult, but but normally, you know, there's always standing room, there's always seats. Particularly in Ashley, way up, way up high, the oxygen seats. You can get in, but the main, it's good fun. It's great. Especially during the first week when there's so many people. That's the little selling opportunity. But the second week, you have a situation where there's less people because there's less matches. And, Sales sort of go down. The first week was really exciting. It's a lot of fun because a lot of the fame, well known players are on the outer courts. Right. So you can see them both singles and doubles. It's terrific for the years. And yeah. where is the booth? I, well, if it's in the same place. It is. Yeah. 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 Um, it's like court 17. So, yeah, okay. It's back in court 16, 17, sort of on the south side of. There's a whole sort of a, a, a whole line of shops, what we call an array of shops, right? Uh, there's Emirates Airlines there, and there's, there's us, there's a company that sells tennis tours around the world, booksellers, all that kind of stuff. Great. Thank you. 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 Th
You used to have a really great spot. Yeah, yeah right, 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 spot right, right, yeah, right in the dead center of my square, the main thoroughfare. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit harder, but it's still it's still exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a lot of, of foot traffic, so it's, it's great. And then there um, is, could, could folks speak up that our, our, our people are here? There, there is. There is going Sharon, to be, can you go so I can see the chat in case there are any questions in the chat? If they're doing the uh, security credentialing like they did in previous years, you do have to go in person to the U.S. Open uh, before it starts to sort of get your photo taken, you know, uh, and things like that. And then they'll you know, tell you where, where the office is and kind of located in a different spot every time. Is there a food court or lunches provided? You will get uh, food passes, uh, cards. How did it work? One of the challenges for us is that the last open that we did was 2019 because of the pandemic. There was no open in 2020. And then we had what was called a virtual booth last year in 2021. And so, um, but, but what, was it a food card? That it was a card. It, had, it was like a certain value on it. Yeah. And then you could use it at the, uh, the food court. That's the, that was the on the US. It will not be extravagant. Um, <laughs> um, every, 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 I mean, we pay for them. So every, every, every dollar that goes to an expense like that takes away from the, the, the fund. Right. But we don't want to ask people to come and not provide them. We, we feel like we're asking you for a serious commitment. You know, several matches, several hours, uh, travel time, and, um, and, 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 and it seems completely reasonable that you should be able to eat something uh, uh, in conjunction with that. But the US Open prices, the first time I saw them, were <laughs> a bit staggering. <laughs> There are two questions in the chat. Um, can you read yes, I can. So the first one is about uh, transport. So um, trying to figure out how to get to the U.S. Open and if someone chooses to drive, is there parking? So the easiest thing is the number seven, right? Yeah, correct. Right. Right. The easiest thing is the number seven, and we don't we don't provide any. You can park as though if you if you want to park, you can park as though you were at, at, the at the stadium. But we don't underwrite that in any way for a driver. You would have to absorb that cost yourself. But the number seven takes you right there. The number there's, seven is an option. There's the Long Island Railroad too. Oh. And the Long yeah. Island Railroad, right? Yeah. Which will stop at Shea Stadium, U.S. Open, during the U.S. Open. It doesn't normally, but it will. And then one of the other questions is about uh, getting the credentials. Um, do you get the credentials the day that you're working or do you show up before the tournament to, to get them? Uh, yes, that's all the credentialing process should be completed prior to the start. To your first shift. Yeah, prior to your that. And that should be well taken care of before your first shift. Uh, so hopefully sometime in August, you know, we'll get the ball rolling. We're waiting to hear from USTA uh, to start that credentialing process. I mean, we've been in contact with them, but, you know, they told us to hold our horses. You, you'll usually get your credential when you go into wherever their credential office is, and then you'll do a you know, photo, they'll check your ID, and then you'll get it, and then you'll have it, because you don't want to have to, it would be nice if you could do it, but it's going to be a little hectic and crazy for you to pick it up and, 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 and do your shift. So these are going to be separate trips to to US. And, and, and try not to lose it. All right. Sherry, <laughs> <laughs> um, more questions? Um, I see in terms of selling merchandise, do we need to use Square to take credit cards? In the past, uh, they we've had a real registry. Yeah, we have a cash register which changes every year. You got to learn how to use the thing. It gets more complicated, but they they take credit cards. Uh, American Express has a thing where they have a chip. This was introduced about on the last one. Where they just touch the thing. It's just a touch thing. Now everybody has a chip in their credit card. Yeah. But it's it's getting easier and easier for that. So credit card, cash. It's not a problem after the first 
five or ten minutes of selling a couple of things here. You know, it's not a problem. Okay. There was another question about parking. Um, someone's coming from New Jersey, and so um, do we know how much parking costs? Uh, I have no idea. We can find out. Um, also, we're trying to work on a few passes, so you know, I, I don't know uh, how that's going to work out, but we have asked the USTA uh, about passes for a few people, so uh, let's, let's stay tuned. Yeah. Most, most parking is in, in that stadium at the yeah. other side of the railroad. Okay, so it's pretty, it's easy to just have other options. Yeah. It's going to be like event parking, so you know, yeah. it won't be cheap. The only, the, only, you know, I was gonna say, the only fun part of park, parking sometimes is when there's a baseball game and the open zone <laughs> at the same time. And so, you know, the, the advice is to come a little early to get a parking spot. Right. If someone wants to make a donation, how do we take the payment? Um, when you will, you will have instructions on how they can go onto a website for the Spark campaign. So they will, um, presumably everyone coming up will have some kind of device. Um, uh, phone or whatever, and, and the volunteers will be taught how to bring them to the page where they can enter their credit card number and all of that good stuff. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions. Oh, wait. Uh, okay, I think this is just people giving each other tips. Um, so it looks like US Open parking is $25 per car. Uh, according to the website. Okay, yeah, this is, oh, one more. In the past, some people wanted to give cash. Can we accept that? No. Cash in UCLA and donors, there's, there's a bad history there. <laughs> Don't get me and Christine started. Don't go there. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing, cash, but. Um... <laughs> Oh, that's an excellent question. Let's repeat that for the Zoom people. Uh, yeah. Someone here asked if there are still open slots. Yes, we do have a few open slots, uh, mainly the first three days of band week. So that's the 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Uh, there's also uh, like the evening shift, uh, September 7th. I think that's a Wednesday. Uh, but otherwise, we are, uh, you know, we, we're really thankful and appreciative of the fact that we got some, you know, good volunteers to fill up the slots pretty quickly. And I, we, 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 we've put this in an email, but I, I, I'll repeat it. You know, this first, the, the first everything after COVID is, is always an experiment in whatever way of life it is. We want you to be feel safe and comfortable in this environment. We want you, if you have tested positive, to not feel like, oh, well, I don't have symptoms, I'll go anyway because they need me. So we're populating the um, booth with a few more volunteers than we might have in the past. We've asked people to reach out to Mike if they're willing to be on a list of last minute people. So it's, you know, Two, two, two of the three people on this shift have COVID, can you come in? Right. If you have flexibility like that, let Mike know. Because we don't want anyone to feel like they have to show up uh, if their health is compromised, because you don't need a public health lesson from me. Um, <laughs> we, 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 all know, uh, we all know how that goes. If you want to, um, uh, whatever your own protocols are with mask wearing, um, observe, observe that. We want you to be comfortable, uh, comfortable that way. We're not going to impose any rules the USTA doesn't impose on attendees, but we um, um, are going to follow, as you can see by the paperwork. Now, were we supposed to get people's signatures on something today? If we could, Christine, what's the story with that? Yeah, so um, for those on Zoom, I'll actually send it to everybody that has signed up to volunteer. Um, some information we've received from the USTA, um, some on vaccination requirement information, 
um, there is something that they want you to sign and send back. And um, maybe, you know, I'll have you send it back to Mike and I once you've signed it. And um, I think that that was it, but I'll send all of you this when I also send you the Zoom recording so you can watch again. Christine, do you have any wrap up remarks? Oh, wrap up remarks. Um, thank you again for all volunteering. We're very excited for this opportunity. It, it should be a lot of fun um, and we hope you learn even more about Arthur Ashe and his legacy. All right. Um, Chineri, Yolanda, and I will be around in person that second week, some of the day. So we'll see the people who are who are volunteering, hopefully in person then. Um, oh, Chineri, can you put the presentation back up one more time? Yeah, yeah, let me do that. Go right. to, um, this uh, yeah. Okay, let me make it. Yeah, good. this is this is one of the, the quotes from Arthur that is, but go back one. Okay. Yeah, so you may have all of this already, but in case you don't, this is how you reach Mike, Christine, de, the head of development who oversees that SPARC campaign I've been talking about is Joy McKee, and um, this is this is how you find me. Okay, yeah. Uh, Wrong yeah. email? Did yeah, I put yeah, it again? Yeah. No, no. Uh, just delete the one. Yeah, yeah. Just, just delete the one, but the rest of it is fine. Okay. M O'Neill six at NYC dot Oh yeah. Okay. No one. Okay. And you've been in touch with her. Some poor guy's gonna get a bunch of emails. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Joy will be. All right. Thank you on Zoom. Thank you in person. Thank you. <laughs>